you all for coming. This is my very first and last art talk. <laughs> so bear with me while I kind of wing this. So I wanted to start by just telling you all where I came from and what it means to be Métis um, and my upbringing. So where my inspiration came from and the process to where I am now. So this is the main painting that you've probably all have seen in the advertisings. So this is where I grew up on a farm, um, a hobby farm. Uh, this was 300 acres, mostly of just forest and trails. It's a very important part of our family and our lifestyle to be part of connected to nature and uh, everything outdoors. So this is in Northern Alberta where um, there's a lot of Cree and Métis people. So that's my mom and my son. <laughs> Very cozy, cute little farm. And this is where we spent most of our times on Sunday. So we grew up very Catholic. We'd always go to church every Sunday. When we got home from church, my dad would always be there playing the fiddle, practicing, getting ready to go. We'd wait for grilled cheese and tomato soup. The phone would ring. Back in those days, everybody would run to the phone as fast as they could, like a race to see who could get it. And it was usually. Uh, somebody, it's no, he'd say, he'd say, if you're bad bear, or be barbie barbie bebe, and we, we'd all know immediately that Henry forgot to put his teeth in, and was asking my dad if we were going to go to the farm. My great grandma, and my grandma, and everybody grew up on this farm, so everybody would gather there on Sundays with all their fiddles and their guitars, and we'd all play on jig, all matey fiddle music. That was the Métis culture. Music is what connected everybody. So that's where we would gather. There's my mom and dad. Fishing is a big part of our life, a uh, big part of all Métis people. And there's my mom and my sisters and I. So you can see that clearly my dad is the one who's Indigenous and my mom is Irish. All the red hair. And this is the, um, the gatherings. This, uh, the only picture I could find, but this is my uncles and everybody. Uh, this is what they would do. They would all play the fiddles, the banjos, pianos, mandolins, guitars, and um, everything would work around music all the time. My dad would make his fiddles. Mm. Part of the Métis culture is making your own fiddles because originally Métis people um, well, they were the Europeans who came to Canada and then they mixed with the indigenous local ladies. So the music would come as a mix of the Scottish and Irish and they came up with their own tunes, which they called reels. It was a very important part of the culture. They would bring fiddles on the fur trade expeditions on canoes to help keep the rhythm of the, the paddlers. So there'd always be a fiddler playing on the canoe as they traveled. So my dad learned how to make his own. He taught himself entirely. Um, most of the people couldn't afford the European fiddles. So they made their own and they called them land fiddles because they created them from what they could find around them. So he taught me how to play when I was eight and made mine. Um, I was the only one who carried on the fiddle tradition. I tried to teach my kids, but they, they're not as interested. So he taught me how to play piano as well, but my sisters were the ones who would usually do the courting with piano. And then me and all of the men would play fiddles. I was the, the, the male girl. So this, um, the very important part of Métis where you can identify Métis people is by the sash. So if you see an indigenous person wearing a sash, this is the Métis sash. It was a very important part of fur trade culture. They would use the sash, it was about six feet long. They would use it to carry things. They could use it as a towel. Um, they could use it as a rope to haul stuff in. And all of the little tassels you would see um, hanging on the bottom of the sash, those are extra string that they would keep and, and have a little needle next to it, that they would use it for emergencies for like first aid, stitching, stitching their clothes. And every family had their own color of sash, um, just like the Scottish have their own. Um, clans, the Métis people identified themselves with the colors of their sashes. But that's, that got lost after the Louis Riel, where a lot of Métis people went into hiding. 
they're trying to bring those different colors for families back for the different communities now. So I just wanted to show you what Métis music and Métis jigging is, since it's so significant part of our culture. So the Red River Jig is actually more like a, kind of like what we consider a national anthem for Métis people. And it's very important for me to make it clear of what Métis is because it's so different from what Métis is considered in the Maritimes. It's an entirely different culture to itself. For some reason, we have the same name for the Nova Scotia Maritime Métis people, but the original Métis is a completely different culture on its own. So here is our Red River, River Jig. And this was a very important part of our Sunday gatherings and everything where we would jig. So this is our music and our jigging. You okay. need help, is it working? Now, how do I get back to the video, to my PowerPoint? Here, oh, oh, we can still see your PowerPoint. We can't see the video for some reason. Oh, the video is not working? No, is it on your screen? Yeah. Um, maybe just switch to sharing that video instead. Oh, okay. Um, okay, okay, here it is. So you'll see the different footsteps and um, the different way that we dress that uh, makes Métis dance different. Can you see now? We can see it. We can't hear it, but we can see it. weird I don't know why you can't hear it but anyways you can see the footsteps anyways right and how different are oh oh no how do I get back you can do Story. it Sorry, that's this okay. technology man <laughs> I don't know how to get back in there powerpoint where's the zoom gone again share screen there we go go back in okay well sorry that didn't quite work go back where we were okay well i'll just post a link on my website so another part of our culture is taking care of animals and respecting nature so we it's very important to try to learn to live off the land as much as possible so we had our cows that's me. Um, when I was young, we would bring the cows in the house in the winter because when they're born in February and March, sometimes it's minus 40 degrees still, so they would have to come in the kitchen sometimes. Um, me and my sister would sneak them in. And this is my son. We have chickens and ducks, and they love learning to take care of the animals as well. So we don't eat these animals. We um, just take their eggs, basically. Um, and we have ducks, so we bring them in the house and I just want the kids to learn how to respect all the animals. That's Kitty, so she thinks she's a cat. And gardening is extremely important. We had enormous gardens growing up, so we have enough vegetables to last all year. I try my hardest. We have enough potatoes in my house here for a year um, and cucumbers and carrots, but I, I hope to keep on adding to my garden and teach the kids those traditions and importance as well, greenhouse in my yard for all of our tomatoes. We got enough tomatoes to, to, well, we had enough tomatoes to last until December. So this is our cabin. Um, it's on the Lahave River. It's very important to, to have this piece of property, which is actually on an old indigenous settlement so that my kids can learn what it's like to live off grid and that important part of our culture as well. So there's lots of fishing there and uh, 
it's a very spiritual place. As soon as you moved in, uh, we could feel that the indigenous spirits were there. So we asked their permission to move in. And then we had to smudge and offer gift offerings with tobacco. Those are me and my kids. They've learned to fish, chop wood and start fires and do anything they can to survive. So this is what brings me to painting now. My boys have autism. So I taught them to communicate and express their emotions through art and painting. So they would draw what happened in the day at school and we would learn how to work through those social, social situations through drawings and paintings. And they would do art at any place, any time. So I started out as a folk artist because of the colorful, fun, lighthearted um, feeling that it gave me. This is a commission of the history of Hammond's Plains of where I live. So uh, I always found it more fun to do it this way, especially since I had kids. And so I did folk art as my main income for a few years, just mostly doing houses and people's families. And um, yeah, so it was just really kind of fun and cutesy. And then I lost um, somebody close to me. And I sat down one day hoping to paint a moose for above my couch. I wanted to redecorate. And this is when all of a sudden time passed and I had this big painting of clouds. And I realized that I had just spent about four hours talking to this person and had felt completely like I was really communicating with them. And I felt at peace. So that's when I started to shift into clouds and realizing how therapeutic art is and how spiritual it is. And um, I was surprised. I was like, this is supposed to be a moose. Look at this. Wow. Okay. So, so then I started to mix up my clouds, the spiritual feeling with folk art so that I could sort of tell the story of um, different indigenous stories and feelings that I had, but incorporating both of those styles because I hadn't quite come up with my style yet. So it was a process. So this is the return of daddy when daddy comes home. Yeah. And I continued on doing that with uh, more skies and more little folk art people. So they're not completely realistic because they're just kind of just like a vision. And uh, ice fishing, I, I actually painted this one for my dad because ice fishing was a very important part of our life. Um, I never got to give it to him because he, he died um, unexpectedly. Um, so the cloud started getting a little bit more extravagant, but still incorporating some folk art. So same thing. And now that I started to get a little bit more away from the folk art and expand on my clouds a little bit to connect a little bit more with spirits. So this was a gift offering to my cabin to the indigenous spirits there um, that I have, I have hanging in my cabin when I started to connect more deeply with, with spirits. And it turned out that I was actually channeling some. So this is my first um, one where I actually channeled a spirit for somebody. I wasn't expecting to do it. I didn't know this person. Um, but I felt that I had a message for her and I painted this for her. She, um, she is the wife who had my cabin before I got it. And uh, I guess he died on his way home from building my cabin. He passed away. And so the cabin was, um, was, was, was left abandoned for nine years. And I felt that I needed to um, share a message with her. And so I painted this and told her everything that I heard and saw and she felt at peace. So we kind of, she just kind of gave me the cabin in, in, in some spiritual way. So um, that was me being vulnerable because I didn't realize that I could do that. And that's what's um, kind of brought my art to where it is now. And when I wasn't channeling spirit through painting, I would be having visions. And sometimes I felt it was very, very important for me to try to capture those visions through my paintings um, so that I wouldn't forget what I saw, what I experienced. This is an experience I had here where I saw the, um, a welcoming party. 
um, and spirits waiting to enter to the other side. So I wanted to capture that exactly as I saw it. And I would be sitting, I was in the little right corner there watching all of this, but they wouldn't let me come closer. And so this as well is, is an entrance to the wel a welcoming party. When I had lost somebody named Russell yeah, on a Saturday, I had a vision of this doorway. And this painting is in the show. You can see it at the Chester Art Center. I had a vision um, in the middle of the night. Uh, Russell was going to pass away at 1030 in the morning on Wednesday. I didn't know he was sick or anything. There was no sign of any. It was just sudden. So I knew I had until Wednesday. And I couldn't say anything to anybody because they would have just thought I was nuts. See, there's nothing wrong with Russell. He's not going to pass away. And, but I saw this doorway and the people inside were very excited. It was very bright. It was full of light and warmth. And it's something I can't explain, but um, they wouldn't let me get close enough to look inside. He said, this is not for you. This is Russell's party. It starts 1030 on Wednesday. So I took the next few days off just to enjoy my time with Russell. And then Wednesday morning at 10.30, he passed away, just completely unexpected. Unexpected of everybody else, but I knew it was coming. So I knew he, where he was going and it was okay and it made it easier to, for that transition. So that's that painting that's there. And this as well is another one that was um, a vision where I saw the three spirits coming to, to um, welcome somebody else. And uh, the same thing happened with the, I knew what time of day it was gonna come and that there was three spirits that this car was going to be driving through and it was going to be kind of pushing them aside off the road. So um, it was very reassuring to see and know that it wasn't entirely an accident. There was uh, three welcoming visitors waiting for this to happen and it was their time. So I wanted to capture that exactly as I saw it. And the same thing similar here, but this one is a little bit different where um, this wasn't a welcoming party. This is when you visit spirits on the other side that um, aren't about to pass or anything, but it's the place that we go at night when we want to visit. So there's like no indication of walls. It's just an empty void kind of. So this is what I, I saw. I saw my dad talking to my grandpa. I just saw them talking in between time and space where shadows are non-existent. So I called my dad the next day and I said, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> I didn't want to tell him everything I saw. I said, what you doing? And he said, well, I'm, 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 I got out a picture of my dad and I wanted to create a frame for him and put my dad up on the wall because I've been thinking about him today. And I said, oh, that's interesting because I kind of knew that. Um, and I painted them talking. I said, I know, I know you're talking to your dad because I saw you talking to him last night. So that's, uh, that's what that is. I just wanted to capture it exactly as I saw. I was in the little right corner looking up into this empty time and space, saw them talking. So this also is another spiritual piece. Um, I had visions for a week of um, a welcoming party. I didn't know who it was or anything. I couldn't get a clear picture of who it was. And I felt one day that I was in an absolute race. I had to wake up, didn't even have time for coffee or to get dressed. I needed to paint this um, person walking this man to their welcoming party. And by the time I was almost finished, I got a phone call that my dad had, had gone to the hospital. So I knew then that I was walking him. I was the one in the painting and he was the man. And I had no idea that that's what I was doing because I couldn't make it to Alberta. And I knew then that that was the way that he was reaching me. So that's what that is. And so then after he had passed, I would get messages and visions where he would phone me because we live so far apart that I would get um, the only way we would communicate is through the phone. And every time he he'd visit me in dreams, I would see 939, that's our phone number, 939, and then the rest of it, but it was always 939. So I would see 939 on radio and stuff in dreams where he would be talking to me and things. And that's what that, that, that is. It's just the phone call from dad. So then I, I, I wanted to kind of dig deeper into my roots a bit and um, 
the feeling that indigenous lifestyle gives me and the warmth and comfort. So I would do a lot more teepees at this point and more TVs, but clouds too. I, I like to do them glowing because it creates that warm hearted feeling that the, the lifestyle gives me. So that was my own family in there, me and my kids and my husband and the animals at the time. And more spiritual teepees here. And at this point it was all acrylics. I, I used to only paint in acrylics. And uh, sometimes I would do, um, I like to capture the feeling of having a spirit watching over you. Then I got into uh, the feelings of ladders and doorways. I love them because they kind of bring you somewhere else. Like, are you going up? Are you going down? Are you connecting to something else? Um, so I love ladders. And this one's still going, the idea of going somewhere, um, like the race against time, um, through storms of all sorts, the fight that we all kind of go through in life. And then, so there's, I'll just have a couple of the doorway ones to show you. You see the textures in these pieces, they are, they're dirt. I like to incorporate dirt as texture because it connects to the earth, the land, um, mother nature, spirit earth. So I would often use, um, whenever you see textures in my paintings, it's pieces of the land. I bring pieces of the land from different places where I connect with spiritually, like at my cabin or back home in Alberta and certain places along the Bay of Fundy that are very spiritual, you feel the energy. So I would bring that mud, I have bags of mud at home here where I would put in some of the pieces. This as well on the bottom has pieces of earth. Um, and, and the idea here is this is when I shifted to oils. So this was the um, a little box of like secrets and ideas being revealed when we all kind of try to uh, uncover who we really are. So that's what this piece is, is the, the secrets revealed. And um, this is just another a cloud one, one of the ones that I kept for myself. I don't keep many for myself. And sometimes I wonder where they end up. And then it's like a little piece of you out there somewhere. You wonder where it is and kind of miss it sometimes. Um, so that I'm just gonna look for the names of this one. This one is when the sun plays peekaboo. This is one of the first big cloud ones I did when I joined Made in the Maritimes. And it's a pretty big one. Now I want to see what number I'm on so I can find the names of these. Sorry. Oh, I remember this one. This is when I was, I was looking at the lightness and darkness. You'll notice that it's never quite clear where the light is coming from. I kind of just have light coming from all directions. So it's never clear because to me, that's kind of like the way light, the way life is. It's not, it doesn't all come from one direction. You can get ideas from all different places or healing from all different directions. So this is the idea of uh, misfits and rebels when they find the light, um, when, they, when they've seen the darkness and the light. So, and this is just brilliant. This is just me experimenting with blues because blues aren't really my thing. They don't really give me that warm, fuzzy feeling. So I was just experimenting. Um, and this again, you can see much texture. This is earth from all different spots that I have incorporated from all locations. And then I got into some truth seekers. So. I like the idea of seeking truth in life through spirits, connecting with them. And I wanted to try to capture what I see sometimes. So these are what spirits to me look like sometimes when they're just a little ghostly figure that you can't actually make out any actual clear shapes or faces or anything. They're usually just a, a black shadow. More truth seekers, but um, 
I'm getting into more of the universe and that connection to the something bigger. So I wanted to have the sky bigger because it's something bigger than us. But now when I'm not doing something spiritual, I like to do something fun as well. So this was a Thanksgiving piece that I did. It's fairly large. It's a little fun one called She Twisted the Spell of Sugar and Spice to Make Room for Cherries. Because uh, on Thanksgiving, um, my kids don't like cinnamon and spice. So I wanted to have cherry pie instead. So it's just a little fun, little silly one instead of being spiritual, but uh, the colors of Thanksgiving to me that make me warm and fuzzy. So I don't paint in a typical studio on a typical easel most of the time. I like to paint outdoors using whatever I can to prop my paintings up on like trees or chairs or on the floor. I've never bought in a real easel. I usually have a stool or a floor. And, and this one is Finding Grace. Grace is the name of my grandma. And I want to really try to deeply connect to that uh, my Cree roots. So her first language was Cree and that language has been lost in my family. Um, but I try to connect with her spiritually when I paint. And this is Crystal. So uh, Crystal was uh, a human trafficking victim. So I wanted to capture her message. And so it was a ladies of the night series. So I did a series of uh, dark, night skies for ladies of the night and uh, shared their story about it not being their choice that uh, they usually come from really good families and I want to spread awareness that human trafficking is is such a big problem in Nova Scotia we got the highest rate in all of Canada and you would never know it's not on the news and there's a story behind each and every one of them and I want to try to get those out so I did a series on that and this is Scarlett her story as well and this was the last one in that series. Well, it was her name. So these are people that I actually knew and tried to connect spiritually because not everybody makes it out or um, recovers. So this was Leslie's dream. And Leslie never survived. Um, so this was just a fun one I did um, for an indigenous art show for Tadamagush a couple years ago. This is Kisses from Julie, and Julie's my dog. <laughs> so this isn't really a spiritual one here. Um, it's just Kisses from Julie, because Julie's so cute and fuzzy and pretty and makes me feel good, and I wanted to paint a, a picture that made me feel like Julie. <laughs> this is Beyond the Beauty. So you'll notice in the dirt down below in this one, this is dirt from the Bay of Fundy, but within the dirt, is actually a lot of garbage that you would find washed up ashore on the Bay of Fundy. So the Zuppa Theater and the Ecology Action Center had commissioned me to do a piece. And I wanted to kind of capture the idea that from a distance, when you look at the beaches, when you go there, they look so beautiful. But when you get closer, you notice the beaches are actually covered in garbage underneath all the dirt. So much fishing stuff gets washed ashore, elastics, bottle caps, flip-flops everything so that's all hidden in the mud and I wanted to kind of capture that so it looks beautiful at the beginning but mother nature's angry it's just kind of a nasty sky and there's lots of uh, garbage we need to clean up so when they found all the started to find all the graves for the indigenous people I wanted to do something to remember them so this is currently at Tykehart Gallery. And this is, we've found you now back in your mama's arms. So it kind of looks like a Remembrance Day thing, but it's intended to be um, the indigenous spirits who were lost in the residential schools. And they're scattered, you can see there, there's nothing's in order or orderly. And um, again, this is an Indigenous one. This one is at the show right now, the Chester Art Center. You can see it's um, intended to represent the Great Spirit. It looks like popcorn, but it's the Great Spirit. And down below are just, this, just the, the shadows of a past that's no longer there. 
This one also is at the Chester Art Center. And um, this is me craving the, the old ways. Uh, what is this called again? The yearning to return. So this is the lifestyle that I would like to live and return to. It's a feeling of connection and community. Everybody works together. You can see in here, there's all just women. The women all work together to hold down the fort, basically, when the men are all off doing their hunting and fishing. And the women are so strong and able to just survive off one another, sharing children. Um, like they say, it takes a village. So I just wanted to kind of capture that. You can see the, the, the woman carrying her little baby in her back. They often carried them um, all tight and squeezed in on those little backpacks. It's so cute and just makes me feel all cozy that I'd so much rather be there. So I wanted to kind of capture that as best I could. Oh yeah, here's close up versions of them. So they have the meat hanging and um, and the one there by the fire. I wanna sit by the fire with her and they would be making baskets. So this also is another one um, at the show right now. And it's a spiritual relationship with the land. So this is, um, now I realize in Nova Scotia, the indigenous people never had teepees, but I incorporate teepees in the indigenous land, Nova Scotia landscapes because it's who I am, but I know that they never had those here along the Bay of Fundy. But you'll see the cliff there is like the Bay of Fundy because this is meant to be over by Avonport. I have a, a very strong connection to Avonport. Whenever I go there, when I first moved here, there was this indigenous spirit on top of the cliff, this lady, and she would just watch, but she was sad. But I know that there was a settlement there. Very small little family. I know that there was a settlement right there on top of the cliff. So I wanted to kind of represent that somehow. So this is a painting, Wendy, that you just bought. This um, is also a spiritual piece, but this is actually, it's called Through His Eyes. And when I say through his eyes, it's through my cat's eyes. So <laughs> it's silly. But when my, um, before I had kids, my cats were my absolute life, right? And uh, when I, I moved here six, uh, 20 years ago, Simba went missing within the first couple of days and I was just a mess. So I decided that I was just gonna try to meditate and see through his eyes. Where are you? Let me just see through my eyes. Sounds insane, but I thought, well, why not try it? So I looked through his eyes and I saw a blue bin, this color of blue. I saw a lady with short gray hair and glasses and a, and a black cat. And I was like, okay, I see it, I see it. Where are you? Where is this? And I just knew where to go. So I went to this place the next day, um, uh, the entire other side of my community. I went there and I was just walking back and forth by this person's house. And like, I know it's here, I know it's here. And then I saw Simba run around the back of the house. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it really is here. So I knocked on the door and I said, excuse me, but my cat's in your backyard, can I go get him? And she said, well, first of all, what do you think she looked like? She had gray, short hair and glasses. And she said, oh yeah, your cat's been there all week. He's been playing with my black cat out there. So I said, oh, okay, I knew that. Of course he is, it's, it's insane. So of course it's, it's real. So she's like, come with me, I'll go get him for you, let's go. So we went to the shed and there was a bunch of blue bins stacked up and the blue cat crate. So we went, put him in the blue cat crate and I took him home. So it's like, oh, I guess I can see through cat's eyes too. So that's what that is. And, um, oh, what is this one called again? Growth begins at the end of the comfort zone. So I find a lot of us get stuck in that comfort zone and then we don't end up growing in life. So I've just been at this place where I'm kind of trying to step out of that comfort zone and grow. So that's what that is. It's just a big, a bunch of little growths happening. And that's an oil at the show as well right now. And I think the pieces look much better in person at the show than online. It's hard to capture the color exactly as it is. This is omnipresent as well at the show right now. 
um, omnipresent is the it stand it, it means the feeling of the spirits always being with you they're always present you might not see them but they're always present so that's omnipresent to me and uh, this one as well is an oil at the show and it's called i met an angel today and i it is also a spiritual one of course so this is when we were in a um a really really tough spot and we called the mental health crisis line and it went to voicemail so i was like oh my god what are we going to do we were going through a crisis um and we were in the middle of nowhere there was nobody around to help and so all of a sudden out of the blue this man walks over and he had the eyes of a wolf he was like gorgeous but it was it was so bizarre he came in um, and because my kids have autism. So immediately he went to the kids, comforted them, and it was all better. It was just amazing. He really was an angel out of nowhere. So I, I, I know that my dad sent him. So I wanted to capture that somehow with the, the glowingness of his eyes and that magic feeling. Another oil one at the show. This is, uh, oh, what is this one called? That's not that. I don't remember what the name of it is, sorry. Um, and this is a vibrant memory as well. This is an oil at the show too. Um, it's just that vibrant memory that, uh, just a, a personal memory that I had. I wanted to kind of put it on canvas. Oh, same as this one too. Another oil one at the show. This is a few people's favorite because of the bright colors of that orangeness against the dark blues. And this is Embracing Femininity. Femininity. It's a soft, um, just a soft feeling. Um, femininity is hard for me. So I wanted to just try to um, embrace that a little bit with something a little bit more softer instead of all um, wild and free, I guess. We all have that softer side that I'm just trying to get a hold of. And this one is also at the show. We had a discussion about this one at the opening. It's uh, this too shall pass. And it's that feeling of it, eventually it'll pass, but you're never gonna quite get to it. So you can see over the horizon, there's a little bit of a glow. Um, eventually it'll pass and you'll get to it but it's very far in the distance it kind of feels like covid and this one's no regrets so no regrets in life i wanted to to, to put that on canvas somehow and you know it's these little incidents that happen but there's no regrets so there's a little white spot up in the top left that just little things that happen, but it ends up flowing. Just uh, just like clouds, you know, they just kind of come and go, but they always work themselves out and end up beautiful somehow. So yeah, there we go.